okay, what are we first, what are we finding? Um, I've looked at two sorts of papers, those that drill down in country and those that are looking at the um, conceptual frameworks. Um, and I think we're beginning to get clarity on uh, information about how we achieve those uh, ESPER outcomes. The clearest information is that we can uh, pretty much point to how, to how ecosystem services will prevent poverty or at least provide safety nets. There's a fair amount of evidence on the strategies that work for this. In terms of ecosystem services producing routes out of poverty, um, from what I've seen so far, the information is less clear. We haven't delved too much into the poverty traps, you know, people trapped in areas, low value soils, trying to make a living, issues of the resource curse. But nonetheless, poverty prevention seems uh, pretty clear. What, what, um, what it seems to me is that all of these in-depth, in-country studies uh, set the tone for the future. This is the kind of information we need on a routine basis uh, in the future. On the one hand, just individual studies can't go through the kind of uh, breakthroughs that we need in terms of understanding about definitions, in terms of building the capacity and building the whole amount of evidence and changing policy. The individual studies can't do that. It's too big a burden. We need to link the studies and we need more of this on a day-to-day -day basis. Routine assessment in country of those links. What really leads to positive change. But the, the overall ESPER question is what are the conditions, what are the circumstances under which ecosystem services will contribute to poverty uh, reduction? And again, we're beginning to get clarity on this. I think it's really interesting how the papers have actually asked people, re really asked people about what the outcomes are. They've asked about needs we were hearing in, uh, in Kenya. Uh, where are, we've, we've had various papers ask people about the values they see, their values, not uh, economists' values. I think the papers have pointed to the importance of governance, particularly issues of access and entitlements, and people's agency and, and the ability to uh, uh, assert preferences. Um, I think we're also pointing to the fact that we shouldn't be too myopic on ecosystem services. There's a whole set of other things, complements that are needed, and being able to treat those two together in, in governance terms has been important. Lots of the papers have tried to look at win-wins or very extreme trade-offs. We don't yet have those that are pointed to the optimum mix in the landscape uh, or, or, or to kind of mosaic management. I suspect some of that is to come and, and that is clearly an important factor. I think uh, another thing that's coming up is that all of this uh, depends very much on the, the, the broad kind of developmental paradigm. If it's a country with strong decentralization, the, the policies required are very different from those with a kind of privatization uh, policy or, or those where, where greening is important. So the policy context matters. But anyway, as I say, I think we're beginning to get the kind of clarity. You know, when you have, say, I don't know, we talked to the chief economist of DFID and he says, how do I get income poverty reduction? Because I'm only interested in income poverty reduction out of ecosystem services, we're beginning to get some answers. There's, a, there's some really nice papers on uh, the conceptual frameworks, you know, a couple from Fisher et al., Vera, Villa, Lele, Dor. I think these are really, really interesting, and worth, a, worth a read. I, I've tried to summarize each one uh, for myself. And that shows great evolution since the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment in elaborating that chain from ecosystem to well-being, <clears throat> in, in the different disciplines grasping this and trying to normalize it, in, in policy spaces, whether it's valuation or payments for ecosystem services, there's a lot that ESPA community is beginning to say uh, that, that really can make that concept sing. Uh, I think the other distinguishing factor is that people have been put right at the center of how people have treated these frameworks. People in their poverty, people in their 
their well-being, and, and the importance of being clear about things like entitlements and, and endowments, things that are very kind of tractable to policy, and the importance, of course, of disaggregating uh, the effects on different groups. We've had this whole time dimension come up, the, 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 the dynamics and the spatial difference. These are things that I think could reinvigorate institutions that have become rather moribund in terms of spatial planning. It could reinvigorate institutions that need necessarily to have a long um, time frame. The problem is, of course, it's getting more complicated, and that complexity is really good for, the, for research and, and in places good for management, but it, it's, it, it's a real barrier to, to policy understanding. I mean, even people working in our field, when you say ecosystem services for poverty alleviation, they sort of take a step back and they need to, to pull it apart. So these kind of multiple terms, multiple definitions, leave everybody potentially at cross purposes, something we have to, to deal with. The, the whole process of integrating environment and development is a real, I think it's a kind of generational challenge. I mean, Paul yesterday took us back to uh, Brundtland and Rio, and potentially e even further, I guess. Um, and we're not going to solve this overnight. And uh, I think the problem is different countries are at different stages. So I've divided countries arbitrarily into four. And depending on where you are, you understand issues like ecosystem services for poverty alleviation rather differently. So, I mean, basic level, a country that doesn't integrate these two things at all, we have extreme silos, we have conflict or no action. Most countries are at least at the safeguard stage. They realize there are some links and there are lots of procedures in place in a social impact assessment, EIA, to start to, to handle uh, these two sides of the equation with a sort of compromise outcome. A lot of the current discussion, the discussion around Rio plus 20, I think was more at the synergy space, looking for those win-wins as much as you can get within the current sort of basic governance rules and financial rules, so payments for ecosystem services, all sorts of green incentives, certification schemes, how do, how do we get those win-wins? And that's where a lot of the discussion is at. There's, I think there's a final stage, a stage that ESPER is leaning towards. I think a stage that those who are pushing for green economies are leaning towards, where you actually have to change the institutional system to achieve even more than you can currently achieve. It's what I call a transformation stage. And the whole focus there is to change the fitness of the institutional system. And you're going to have to change governance rules there. Now, I point this out because countries are at different stages. So as you introduce SPAR into those different stages, you'll meet with different reception and understanding. And of course, we, we get the problem of language. If you say green economy at one level, it means a completely different thing to other levels. So as um, Artic reminded us yesterday, uh, ESPA is aiming at a moving target. Depends what level you're at, depends what level of understanding, and policy context change. The target is moving, but I think the time horizon is really long. I do think, as I say, somehow what ESPA is finding needs to be wired into institutions for the future. So what kind of entry points are open to us? I think, I mean, there are, of course, so many ways in which change happens or doesn't happen. And, and ultimately, it's things like uh, fashion for the youth or, or, or faith and religions uh, and, you know, big business. I mean, that, at the moment, those are the things that really determine uh, what actually changes societally. If we want to make a difference to that, I think there are four basic levels that we can aim at. We can change the evidence about what, what's important to people and what happens. We can build capacity to do things differently. But I think then perhaps the most important and most difficult, uh, and, and only with these will you get real institutional change, is to change the power base and to change the kind of narrative values or, or paradigm. 
I mean, uh, currently you have a power base that's you know aimed at elites and big capitalism, and that is solidly in place. But there are those agents of change with currently no power, but much to say. And somehow, I think Esper should be supporting them, whether they be you know communities wanting to assert their rights or scientists. We need to change the power base. We need to change the narrative about what well-being is, about what good development is. Currently, I think, uh, sorry, my PowerPoint skills are minimal, so you may not be able to read there. I think ESPA has generally focused at the top. That's fair enough. We've been focusing on, you know, building good evidence, those biophysical links that lead to well-being. We've been getting evidence under, of the conditions under which ecosystem services help poverty alleviation beginning to get evidence on things like critical tipping points. And there's a lot of capacity development within ESPAR. Some terrific work on models, methods, interdisciplinarity, um, networking of scientists across the world, the whole notion of fellowships. Perhaps as we move forward, we shouldn't neglect that, but think a little bit more about what we can do to, to point to power that needs to be raised up and to point to new narratives. So in terms of narrative, I mean, it occurs to me that some kind of, some kind of vision is emerging from our work. I don't know what it is, but it, I, it's, it's about what people themselves aspire to, whether it's, I think, a balance of issues of prosperity and wealth with security. We have heard a lot about security yesterday with kind of meaning in life. Perhaps some kind of ESPER vision needs to be pushed forward. Social justice seems to be inherent in everything that, oh, everyone's papers. And true interdisciplinarity and true integration, I think, that's, a, that's the kind of narrative that seems to be emerging. And maybe we want to start to promote that if, if we indeed find it across all our papers. And in terms of power, um, you know, we have more to say about inclusion and fairness. A lot of the papers are, some of the papers are focused on that. Uh, and I think also the informal economy. If we're talking about poverty alleviation in a world where all the institutional changes are about big business, big government, you know, city governments, where people currently are in the informal economy might need to be um, identified. So I thought, um, how would ESPA move forward on these fronts? Uh, I think it's worth thinking about where the catalysts of change might be. And I think, I mean, because we're basically a science-based group, we need to relate to uh, one or two sort of hot areas where there is change taking place and be able to inform them and guide them so they actually lead to something real rather than just noise or the latest thing to come from Washington or the UN. So, and I've just picked the whole green economy discussion, the SDGs discussion that, that Paul raised yesterday, and the whole notion of accounting, national accounting, uh, partly because these are things I'm linked to uh, and know a little bit about, and partly because I do think um, ESPA can inform them. There are many others. I mean, the whole notion of climate change mainstreaming, I think, is also a sort of um, carrier for ESPA uh, knowledge. So the hot topics that can lead to change inform them. The second thing I think is there are existing institutions that aim at integration and have potential to absorb our knowledge, our findings. Uh, and I, I put here the kind of institutions that have been funded and mandated for year after year after year and are now slipping behind the times. So land use planning, natural resource management agencies, the whole kind of notion of sustainable development committees and umbrellas and the whole development process. But of course there are, and I'll focus on that, of course there are others too, particularly local institutions that assert and enable local control of ecosystem services. And of course the good discussion we had uh, yesterday led by Hermant on, on changing science and academic institutions. Let me touch on uh, the four that I've highlighted. Uh, green economy and green growth. I mean, this has become big since the 2008 finance collapse when government said, let's 
Let's find a new source of growth. Oh, yes, we've got to do climate change stuff. Let's grow the green sector. Maybe we can get some more uh, jobs and growth rate there. Um, and since that started, and then the UN and others looked at other possibilities, the whole notion of greening economic governance has come up, which isn't a bad thing, given that Rio 92 talked sustainable development, but really only focused on environment. Uh, Joe Berg, uh, the 2002 summit, started to focus on the social issues. Uh, no one really got to grips with the economic side until Rio 2012. And we have a whole range of institutions in, and initiatives emerging, which uh, I've mapped against the relative emphases on do we want growth, do we want green, or do we want inclusion. It's quite interesting how they're, they're, they're jostling for position. And, you know, the, much of the discussion is still about, you know, men, because it's always men, uh, in capitals in Seoul and Copenhagen, doing deals between big government and big business for high-tech, you know, uh, infrastructure, rather than this one is hosted by the Green Economy Coalition in South Africa, people's groups who have access to resources and they want to use them in different ways and make money and have access to markets. So this, this whole area is, is, is fermenting and ripe for, ripe for improvement. So benefits, it's, it really has got the attention of finance ministers and business. You know, finally, they're thinking, what can we do with this environment thing? Uh, secondly, there are a whole set of international initiatives uh, jostling, so potentially they can, they can play a role. The UN Partnership for a Green Economy is, at least it's one UN trying to work together. There's a new intergovernmental group, the Global Green Growth Institute, which is rather about elite deals at the moment. And the... the uh, platform for civil society, uh, the Green Economy Coalition, that's actually hosted by my institute. It has UN members. So there's, there's initiatives and institutions emerging that we can influence. The, on the one other hand, there are limitations that we actually have something to say about in ESPA. It's focused only on growth, not on well-being, most of them. It's focused on carbon and the attractions of international climate finance rather than the whole range of ecosystem services that you know, could make for a green economy. It's focused on big and formal players rather than poor groups, and particularly people in the informal economy. I mean, that, if that is the real economy, the informal economy, let us start by looking at how that can be green, you know, waste pickers and sustainable agriculture. And because it focuses on elites and carbon, you then you know, run the risk that a green economy is owned by a few, for a few, and of course the risk that you get yet another commodity boom, which is a carbon commodity boom that pushes out other ecosystem services. So, I mean, one idea would be that ESPA could hold its own dialogue, perhaps in country or globally, and bring together evidence that's relevant to where green economy is, is shifting how poor countries, how poor groups value those ecosystem services, what they want from them, uh, what they can do with them, the kinds of enterprises, the kind of glimpses of green and inclusive activity throughout the world that could be driven by poor groups, by social enterprise. Put this on the same page as what the big companies are talking about carbon. Then looking at the current models, their distributional impacts, looking at income poverty, but other distributional impacts. I think uh, Professor Agarwal yesterday talked about the structural barriers to more inclusive green economies. So we ought to be, we have started to find information in ESPA papers on that. Again, focus, I think, on where informal economies might need to be formalized to raise the level of, of enterprise and green and inclusion, and on whose terms. Formalization by communities themselves, perhaps, rather than imposed from the top. And then, of course, for these big initiatives, the kind of safeguards uh, for keeping within ecological limits. So I think we can do something in this ferment. I don't know what it's like in India at the moment, but in many countries, this is setting the, the, the scene for environment development interactions. And we need more science in there.
and less kind of business and intergovernmental blah blah. The second thing I'll point to is the Sustainable Development Goals. Don't try to read this. I mean, it's basically hugely complicated, and you do get this kind of UN syndrome. But, you know, advantages here. This huge political ambition, if you think about it, this is going beyond the NDGs, which kind of worked. It brought the UN together. It kind of inspired national government. But it's now talking about multidimensional poverty. It's talking about actually getting sustainability in those, right across those goals. Universality, in other words, applying to rich, middle, and low-income countries as well. And it's talking about governance change. So, <laughs> boring at the moment, but you know, high potential here to set the framework for many institutions. It's got, as Paul was saying, it's got eco ecosystems right across the piece, focus of two of the goals, with shorter targets than many, 2020, and the whole CBD philosophy is right inside it. And it generally talks about integration, planning and accounting. So, quite good. On the other hand, the limitations. Uh, how, you, how are we going to assess those 169 targets? you know, data needs. This is what something that ESPA can offer. There's no kind of coherent framework. It talks about harmony with nature and getting on okay with forests. Uh, so, you know, we might be able to offer a really meaningful framework that's driven from societal needs and how society works and how ecosystems work. And, and it talks about ecosystems, not ecosystem services which sets us up for a kind of conservation versus development, rather than the kind of intricate uh, co-benefits that, that we're talking about. And there's nothing on the, the cultural side of it or um, local knowledge. So one idea uh, for the brave is to analyze the 17 goals and 169 targets and pull them together in relation to two things. Those that point to ESPA type outcomes, and they're there. And those that talk about the enabling, putting together the enabling condition for achieving sustainable development, and they're there. Uh, in IAD, we did this for the for forest sector, so it's kind of a bit close. Uh, and we've, we literally tore up the, the draft and found that some of them were about what enabled the enabling conditions for forests to contribute to sustainable development. And then others, others were about the benefits that we would seek from better management of forests. And that gave a kind of coherent picture, but it also points to some of the gaps. Uh, I can't quite read them here, but they were, they were gaps in terms of negotiated local land use planning and other mysterious things that you could see if you read the publication, but <laughs> I can't. So there's a notion there. We could analyze it. We'd make a nice little piece. That's making a big difference right now in Lima. We made a big poster out of that. So the SDG is something we could inform. The third thing uh, that I think is interesting is the whole notion of natural capital accounting. And how interesting now that finance ministers, having sort of said no to environment, many of them are saying, yes, development's about managing a portfolio of capitals, growing them, improving their productivity per head of population, balancing them out over time including natural capital. And we have this movement for um, natural capital accounting. Um, and, and, and a lot of it's developing country-based. The Gaborone Declaration uh, has helped countries, encourage countries to have a look themselves. So benefits here. Again, again it's attracting attention of finance ministers and CEOs. We've got 70 countries and 90 companies signing up to this campaign that we will account for our natural capital. There's a, there's a UN methodology that's been agreed, and there's a groups who are spreading capacity, building. Uh, I'm involved with, with WAVE, so that's the World Bank one. Um, there's also, an, at the experimental level, rather than just forest, water, minerals accounts, there's ecosystem accounts, which starts to help us think more about spatial levels. Uh, it's been taken up in several OECD countries as a counterpart to the sustainable development strategies for monitoring 
updating them. Uh, and, and by the way, the whole process has shown in richer countries that uh, cultural existence services are way higher value than anything else, which I think is interesting. It wouldn't necessarily be untrue in developing countries. And, and some lower income countries are, are using it for particular resources that matter to them, you know, whether it's <laughs> diamonds or water. The limitations are this focus on you know, provisioning services. They're not very much disaggregated spatially or by user. So you have problems like um, uh, Botswana Water Accounts shows that the tourism industry makes far more money out of every cubic meter of water than pastoralism. So conclusion, clear off the pastoralists and build some hotels. So we need that kind of spatial, you know, uh, disaggregated element to be able to interpret these findings better. Hence, Esther. Then, of course, there's this remains a definitional confusion. It's great that, that economists, statisticians, natural scientists are all using ecosystem service tech, sort of terminology, but they're owning it and using it in different ways. So with valuation, Goodness, you know, uh, va we, we can't possibly use, um, you know, uh, consumer surplus, say the accountants. We've got to look backwards. It's all producer surplus. Absolute versus marginal valuation. Don't value a forest, value the change in value between different uses. D double counting. It's, it's very contentious. So, again, there's a definitional issue, and we may be at the stage we need to sort it. So, my conclusion on this is that. This has really attracted decision makers, but they need better guidance on how to use it and its limits. So one thought, Who, who's not heard of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment? See, everyone's heard of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, or at least they pretend to because they know it's important. So I think it would be really useful for ESPA to organize a review of what's happened since the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment in 2005. Why? Because it's a common heritage. Economists have used it, statisticians, ecologists. We've all referred to it. We've all, particularly, I think, ESPA, particularly ESPA scientists, we've all developed it, got a better idea. If we bring together a group that says, what have we done since then? What's the sticky issues, like definition? And let's begin to sort it out. Uh, if, if we, I can imagine we've produced really useful stuff like proposing a more operationally sensible definition, a little simple guide to all the complexity, you know, one dimension per page rather than everything on some enormous framework, and say what we're going to do with it for the next 10 years, which will inform the UN who, have, who are going to do an MA number two, and, you know, we don't want to do it the same old way. And we may find other things that are needed. I suspect some kind of charter for valuation that is based on ethical principles, so resolving this commodification of nature argument. So Paul and I have already started talking, and the Rockefeller Foundation is interested. That could be a really useful process. The review of the MA as something that is, is, again, part of the wiring that we need to put into institutions. The final point here, I think, is dealing with existing uh, integrated institutions of, of whatever sort that have the mandate. Um, they're there, you know, they're sitting and waiting in some ways for a better understanding of, of how to balance things. Natural resource management institutions, you know, their standards, issues of entitlements, great policy leverage there. Land use and spatial planning, what do they do these days? Let's give them something to do. Well, apologies if there's a land use planner here. Development planning, all of these committees for sustainable development that kind of base themselves in, you know, two decades old ideas. CBNRM institutions, all of these. I think some of the papers I've looked at have started to pull out the characteristics of effective institutions. So they're all highly connected, not, sort of, not just sort of centre periphery. They're connected to disciplinary and across borders. They're very participatory. They have this kind of emergent strategy with engagement and adaptive learning. 
They've got what I call searchlights, ways of looking for the future. So we're beginning to find those characteristics. Let's highlight some more. The limitations, as I think someone said yesterday, is we've got this inflation of policy, but a kind of collapse of capacity. The institutions can't handle all of these policies. So this enormous agenda, and, and it's actually a kind of the interdisciplinary approach has been project by project rather than wired into the institution. We need to keep that going. And they don't have a sensible framework. To, to, to work to for the future. So they're potential targets. So I think an idea here is to bring together some of our thoughts on the characteristics of effective integrated institutions. How they're made, what their mandate is and where it comes from, how they've evolved, their, their, their rights, their roles, their responsibilities, their relationships, their rewards. And then particularly dealing with the time dimension. How do they... You know, what makes them long rather than a short project? Um, how do they define the optimum mix of ecosystem services in a changing context? How do they get to that mix and keep, keep, uh, keep on top of it while things like land values change? How do they anticipate tipping points much better? I mean, uh, uh, Professor Agarwal yesterday talked about you know, the tendency to act after disasters, well, uh, all the uh, knowledge and anticipation of tipping points. Also, research on their ways of working. What really is effective interdisciplinarity? What really is effective means of engagement? So this is my last slide, just as kind of a sum up. I think we've made a real step change in that interdisciplinary science. <laughs> Most of the papers I've, I've uh, read have about sort of 40 authors, which is a little bit of a sign, isn't it? It's not a kind of one person thing. Though we've got the potential to support the institutional change we need for the future. I just suggested four ideas. I mean, just, just out of the blue, this dialogue on evidence on green economy, looking at the SDGs, testing them against S for outcomes, and Millennium Ecosystem Assessment Review, and then research on effective integrated institutions. Whatever we do, we've got to bridge more the, the communities of practice who are working on this. Um, I'm involved in WAVES, I'm involved in the Green Economy Coalition, International Trades Union Congress is really interested in this stuff. The IRF, the Independent Research uh, uh, Federation, I think, on the SDGs, ICSU, I think, I mean, Paul has also got this on his agenda. Let's take us into these areas. And ESPA is a particularly long project, and, and we've been successful in extending it another two years, but this is a generational change. So I'm really pleased that we have our fellows here to take us into that next generation. Thanks very much.